three, two. I think we're here. It looks like it's live to me. Tristan White, good to see your face, man. Hey, Andy, nice to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. All the way from uh, Australia. You can tell by the accent that it's, uh, you're not calling from Alabama today. <laughs> So. It's uh, it's early here, Andy. It's uh, and it's uh, dare I say it's even it's tomorrow where I am. That's it's, true. Uh, it is Tuesday. It is Tuesday morning here, so you've got there is hope. And and it's also uh, summertime, so yeah. you 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 have nice warm temperatures. I have other friends from Australia. I keep seeing surf pictures and beach pictures and puppies, and it looks like such a beautiful place right now. Where we are, there's ice and snow everywhere. Yeah, well, the, the beauty is, Andy, that um, you do get to experience that. I, I'm in a part of Australia, we don't get, get snow, and maybe you'd say that you don't want it, but, um, but uh, I think the, the full experience is sometimes uh, a, a good thing. Yes, uh, it's pretty for about three hours, and you just wish it would go the hell away. Yeah, and then it's impractical. So let me give you, uh, we've got people still rolling in, and, and I'll give a quick uh, intro, and then we're just going to kind of have a conversation around... Um, uh, building culture at the end of the day. So we're going to talk about that. I do see Kristen McLean is on here. So welcome, Kristen. And uh, Tristan and Kristen, Kristen, Tristan and I were talking about you guys being at Leadership Academy together. So glad that you can be here. For everyone else, Kristen pops in from time to time and she does this really cool uh, graphic representation of the things that we talk about, which will go out in the recap at the very end of this. Uh, we also record this session. So the session will be um, on the website within 24 hours with a recap and Kristen's drawing and it is Facebook Live and we have Leah behind the scenes now. So if you've got questions on anything, oh look, she says, good afternoon, Andy. Um, if you've got questions on anything, please bring them up and we will answer those as best that we can. And again, we're gonna have a conversation. So I'm so excited to have Tristan with us today. He's the CEO of uh, PhysioCo, so TPC for short. Now get this, uh, ranked for 11 consecutive years as one of Australia's best places to work. 11 consecutive years. Uh, when I saw that on this intro sheet, I was like, well, I mean, doing it once is one thing, doing it twice is another, but doing it 11 times in a row says you probably know what you're doing and people should actually listen to you. So we talked in, in, before everybody jumped on about this two-part transformation that, that you swear by and uh, leaders to create a great place to work. So I want to dive into that. Um, but before we do, give the people just a little bit of background on kind of who you are and what you do and, you know, where you grew up and all the kind of background stories so we can lay the foundation for where we're going. Yeah, sure thing, Andy. So let me let me get into it. Let me try and make this the the, the Cliff Notes version, Andy. But uh, look, important part of my story, I'm from Australia. I'm from a little town in the very southeastern corner of the Australian mainland. It's a little town called Foster, not far from Melbourne, uh, the, the uh, capital city of, of Victoria. And I grew up in this little town. I studied physiotherapy or physical therapy, as it's known in the States, in Melbourne. And I I had a plan or a vision that I thought I'd become a physical therapist that would work in the sexy part of uh, the industry, which is sports, physical therapy, and Aussie rules football is big down here, Andy. It's uh, AFL is um, is what the uh, a lot of people follow. The mighty Richmond Tigers is my team. And so I had this early dream to become a physiotherapist, uh, learn the ropes as a junior physio uh, in, the, in some large teaching hospitals, progress over to a private practice and then a sports physiotherapy direction, and ultimately be the, uh, the physio that dashes out onto the arena uh, <laughs> to help the mighty Richmond Tigers uh, when, they, uh, when they busted up their shoulder or their knee or, or, or the like. And it turns out that um, I did finish that physiotherapy degree. I started my career towards sports physiotherapy, but I just didn't, I didn't love it. I had this very early career head versus heart challenge. My head was telling me I'm taking the, the stepping stones towards this career that, that I think is going to be a, a useful one and a purposeful one. But my heart was telling me, Tristan, do you really want to be doing this for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Uh, and I reflected hard, Andy, and it turned out that what I felt like I was doing was helping healthy people become healthier, uh, run faster, jump higher, tackle harder. It was a, a noble cause and a useful cause for someone whose heart was in it. But for me, it just wasn't, it wasn't to be. And how, and long, so, how long were you in that before you figured out that, hey, this may not be my gig? Yeah, it wasn't a long time, Andy. And this is my impatience as well, which is important. But um, so I, I studied physical, physical therapy for four years. 
Um, and, and two of those years was in the teaching hospital in the environment where I would have been moving towards. And when it became time to apply for jobs in that teaching hospital environment, I'm like, oh man, I, I don't, think, don't think I can do this. So um, I, I sort of skipped the first step of my, uh, my dream. I worked in private practice for about a year. It was only a relatively short amount of time, uh, Andy, short time. But that's when I, I moved home to that teeny tiny little town uh, in, in Foster, the southeastern part of the Australia, with my parents. I'd now been to university for five years because it took me an extra year to get the degree done. I've been working for 18 months and I really had no career direction or no, no plan as to where I was going. And I... Um, but something was important to me, Andy, and that is that I wanted to create something useful and meaningful for myself and what I thought was going to be a small group of people that I'd work with. And I reflected hard on what am I going to do if, I, if, if sports physiotherapy is not for me? And it turns out that I really, in that short amount of time that I was a physical therapist in private practice, and definitely my time as a student, I really loved working with older people. I really uh, connected listening to the stories, the history, the, the, the characters that were, and I loved the opportunity to use my physiotherapy skills to help them to be able to walk further, to be able to get down on the floor and play with their grandkids if that's something they wanted to do, to get out on the golf course, whatever it is that, um, that these people who were usually 60 or 70 plus years of age uh, really enjoyed doing. And so, I turned my attention to be a physiotherapist in the ugly duckling of the health world, Andy, and, and that is working in aged care with, with older people. And, and I, I almost didn't tell a soul, Andy, because I was so embarrassed. I was well, you just, went from like professional football to, you know, the, the yeah, nursing homes to nursing yeah, homes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who does that? And I, I told the world, anyone who would listen, I'm going to be the, a sports the man, physiotherapist. The man. Yeah. And, um, and so I very sheepishly, quietly found my way into this one tired, old, a bit smelly nursing home in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. And it was a 12 hour per week contracted job or sorry, subcontracted job. I was a subcontracted physio, the only physiotherapist with these 30 old people. And Andy, I just loved it. It was just, it was just a way to connect with these older people to use my skills, but not in a technical physiotherapy um, uh, measure every millimeter type of way. It was to use my full self and connect as a person and then use those physiotherapy skills to help those people stay mobile, safe and happy. And that became the foundations of the PhysioCo or TPC as, as we now know it. And, um, and Andy, so that first year, I went from working at one nursing home of 12 hours a week to more than a full, I probably was dashing around to nursing, lots of nursing homes about 50 hours a week or thereabouts just myself. After a full year, I started employing uh, one part-time physio and then another part-time physiotherapist. And that's when the Physio Co became a business. And um, we can dive into different parts of this story, okay. but then to, to, to flick forward uh, the Physio Co. Let me ask, yes. let me ask a quick question. I'll, I'll, okay. so I'll press pause for a second. So you've got this transition where you went from something that you thought you were like, I'm designed from birth to be able to do this. And it's yep. really cool. And I talk about it every, all, all over the place to this place that I don't want to tell anybody, but I really got fulfilled with it. Well, talk about the division of the disdain or negative feelings that you had for the place that you chosen and, and how you got into a path of making a different choice. Mm. So, Andy, how I felt when I was started the working with older people is that is that the is well, that the question? So you made this you made this decision to make a, a career move because mm. you didn't like what you were doing. You moved to another career. So for the people that are going to be listening, talk about making that choice. Like what mm. what what flipped the switch for you to get the hell out of where you were to go do something different? And then how did you you know talk about how you made that leap? Because I, there are people today that are going to be listening that probably need to make a change like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I think uh, during the, the year where I was in the sports physical therapy practice and the like, Andy, and, and there was parts of me that just loved it. I, I just loved the idea that I, I got to work with the the elite under 18 sports team on the trainings during the week and travel with them on the on the weekends. Uh, I, I was working with part of the reason I chose this practice was an elite under 18 AFL team was supported by this practice. And I got to, to be one of the physiotherapists. And that was that was super exciting. Great for my ego, Andy. Um, but uh, the reality was I, I dreaded. But in the second half of that season, I dreaded going to finishing work in the practice 
not having finished all my my notes and the important things that I was um, I was supposed to be getting done as a physiotherapist is somewhat drowning in the in the overload of the of the patient administration and, and the files I need okay. to keep, and um, and then heading off to training and uh, I just didn't enjoy the the bits where someone's got some shin splints and we need to to build them a a program to get them off the field for a start, unload them and then reload um, reload them. That, that's to some people it was fantastic to me it was like oh man I, I i just i just want to talk to the person understand what's important to them and then connect on a human to human level rather than on a uh, technician to lower half of their leg type of uh type of level uh, andy so that was what was it was really it was really loading or wearing me down i think the 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 burden of, of that job that i didn't enjoy and i just I, I honestly thought to myself i was young i was 24 years old i'm like there's got to be something different out there. And I don't, didn't realize at the time, Andy, but, but just saying, I'm going to leave this job and I don't exactly know where I'm going, uh, but I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to figure it out as I go. was a pretty brave, a pretty brave move in, right. in the time. Having said that, I had no commitments. It was, it was, a, it was a useful time of my life to be doing something, something like that, Andy. But, um, but man, the relief that I felt when I, the first part of the relief, when I decided I'm not going to continue on this path, and then the energy and, and the passion that I found when I, I really wanted to sink my teeth into something new. Year two, where I was building something versus year one, um, I'm talking about my career. So year two, where I'm building uh, the, the work in the nursing home um, industry versus year one, where I'm getting loaded up with this work that just didn't inspire me. The, the amount of energy and how happy I felt was so amazingly different. And I think that's, that's something to reflect on as, as people consider making these sort of moves. Yeah, so if you got, so I think uh, to kind of paraphrase, if you've got a feeling of, if you don't want to go run towards it, you need to go figure out what you want to run towards every day, right? Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. And some something of those lines. Yeah, it's, it's almost it's a bit like a, a, an approach to, to hiring. If, it, if it's not a hell yes, then it's uh, then it has to be a no sort of stuff, uh, Andy. Yeah. That's the, the same sort of concept. So, Sometimes, but um, yeah. yeah. Shed, you got to shed, you got to shed something before you can ever find something else. So we were talking about you know, year one, year two, you got started building, um, you know, physio. Uh, mm. You went into it basically with a job, like you just took a part-time job to get something started. At what point did you sit down and just answer this question and tell me the rest of the story, kind of where you are today, 11 consecutive years. Um, did you, what point did you sit down and, and actually write a plan for where you wanted to go? That probably wasn't, you know, the first two weeks of being unemployed. Um, but when did you do that? And then catch us up to where you are now and what's going on. Yeah, sure, sure. So Andy, one, one really important part of this story of me as an entrepreneur is that I've, I've had mentors and coaches and guides all the way along the way. And I continue to, ha to have guides. And, um, and uh, when I first came up with this idea of the Physio Co, 12 hours a week in that nursing home in, in, in Preston, the northern suburbs of Melbourne, um, I saw something in my local newspaper in the days when the local newspapers were uh, in their in their prime, and it was an opportunity to connect in a business planning competition or a business planning um, process. And I applied. I, I didn't really know what I was doing. I applied, and I got uh, linked with um, with a Rotarian. So it was called the Shell Livewire Program, sponsored by Shell Oil Company, and uh, connected to a local community organization called Rotary. And I was connected with a mentor called Ben. Ben Hosking was a retired accountant, or semi-retired at the time, now retired. And Andy, Ben and I worked through a process of building a business plan. It was early days, it was rudimentary, but it had the foundations of a profit and loss, a cash flow forecast, a marketing plan, it had the foundations there. And it's evolved a hell of a lot over the time. But early days, uh, getting at least a starting point on paper was really, really powerful for me. And it's changed so many times, Andy. Like that's that's the reality of how strategy works and um and, and planning works. But interesting story, Ben Hosking, uh, after 17 years, continues to be a guide and mentor of mine. I spoke to him yesterday, uh, and he's been a guest on my podcast talking through the, uh, the the mentor experience. And it was it was just really wonderful to have someone so experienced to be with me along the way. So early days is the question is the answer to the question on, on business planning. Um, and Andy, just to quickly um, bring the story together, is that um, years two, three, four, five in the physio co. I, I grew a team pretty quickly. We got to about 20 people over about five years, all working in different nursing homes and helping older people. 
And again, at that point, after year five, I, I felt stuck. I felt like I had a job. I hadn't built an empowered team. Everyone was reporting to me and I was a reactive supervisor, if you will. Uh, and it was at that inflection point where I discovered uh, the important work that, that you do and that, that I've, I'm familiar with, the Rockefeller Habits, the work from Jim Collins, all this important um, systems-based information that helped me to create the foundations of a great place to work. And it was from that year, year five, 2009, all the way through for 11 consecutive years that we were ranked as one of Australia's 50 best places to work. We grew from that, uh, that messy 20-person team uh, through to a 150-person team serving uh, older people all the way around Australia. Uh, and yet, industry, interestingly, uh, we're now into year 17 and we're going through a pivot. There's a change of direction and our team is not, not as big as it was. We're a bit, we're a bit smaller. Uh, there is a global pandemic that we're also working yeah. through, Andy, which is, uh, which I is heard related. About that. Yeah, you heard about that. Um, so all things considered. But, but Andy, that, that in a nutshell is, is the story. Start up, uh, get going, hit some uh, challenges. Uh, fast growth and then some plateaued growth and all sorts of learning and growth along the way. But I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to, uh, to, to lead this organization and I'm blessed to be able to share the story and let's dive into the detail of how we've done that to, to help, help other people. Yeah, it's amazing. It's always amazing to me when I talk to somebody who's been successful and it, they make it, everybody looks at us and say, well, ah, you're such a success. And they're like, shit, it took 20 years, 20 years to get from where we were to where we were 20. Like we had to figure it out 82,000 times between the day we started and today. Um, two things, you've got, a, you've got a book. Could you hold your book up for me? Yeah, 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 yep, yeah, absolutely. A book called Culture, Culture is Everything. Everything. Right, yep. great book, 11 time winner, best place to work. And then you, you mentioned a podcast, so maybe um, tell us, just give us a podcast name so that everybody can hear it and we'll put it in the notes. Yeah, sure, it's called the Think Big, Act Small podcast. Think Big, Act Small podcast. So you guys look that up, we'll put that in the notes as well. Um, so two parts, two parts to culture. This kind of the people side and then the system side. And you yeah. were talking earlier with me and, and saying, you know, I used to be system, 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 systems until I figured out, well, maybe it's people too. Talk, go down that path. Yeah. So, Andy, I, so between 2009 and the, the, you, you already heard the story 11 times, best place to work. And why I keep banging on that, but that is because people kept asking me, Tristan, how do you do it? How do you build a great place to work? How do you build a strong workplace culture? And Andy, I'd give them this long answer that made some sort of sense to me, and they had no freaking idea what I was talking about. It was it was like it was like a complete mystery, and so I realised I had to find a way to communicate it. And by the way, that's an important part of leadership that we've we've all discovered is that uh, clarity, communication is leadership, and leadership is communication is a is a crit critical concept. But anyway, I broke down this uh, how to build a great place to work in the, the way we'd done it at the Physio Co into the culture is everything system and the culture is everything system became the foundation of this, of this book that I released in 2017. And Andy, if you had have asked me at any point in the, in the years leading up to the release of the book and probably for a couple of years after 2018, 2019, I would have answered, if you want to build a strong team culture, follow the system in the book. It's based upon the work of Jim Collins. It's based upon the work of Vern Harnish. It's based upon some really tried and tested work that's been, been now been experimented and tested at the Physio Co. And Andy, I wholeheartedly believe that. But and it's so very important, and we can dive into those into that system very soon. But I was missing something, and I had a closeness problem to this myself. And that is that I didn't realize that I was going through an evolution uh, as a leader myself. I was going from someone who realized that management and leadership was important to actually uh, understanding and being able to be a practitioner of being a great leader who can communicate things in a clear, interesting way, who can understands the empathy and accountability continuum. And, and what I say by that is, when do we need to connect with empathy and when do we need to move that towards more and more accountability to make sure the people in our team are getting the results that they want to get and they are being challenged and stretched and supported in the, in the right way? Uh, how do you give and get a bit better feedback? All these skills that might have no, used to be called the soft skills, Seth Godin calls them the real skills, call them what you will. But I, was, I had this closeness problem, Andy, and I didn't realize that I was going through this evolution myself. I now, life is lived 
through the forward lens, but understood through the rearview mirror or, or something on those lines. And therefore, I now realize that you cannot have an enduring great place to work without a systemized team culture and a curious, calm and connected uh, leader or leaders that are continually moving forward and refining that system. And so that's the two part transformation that um, that we speak about. And does that make some sense to you? Yeah, I want to unpack a couple of things he's talking about. So the first is this, I like this empathy to accountability and the continuum that you spoke about. Um, yep. It's something that I struggle with all the time because I want to live in the accountability side. You know me, like the, you know, every, white shirts, blue shirts, check shirts, everything's, you know, some kind of fucking order. So <laughs> talk a little bit about how you discovered in yourself that this was something you needed to work on. Mm -hmm. And then what did you do to work on it? And what would you suggest that I go do to work on it? Yeah, so well, that's somebody else too. Who knows? Let's talk about this a little bit because it, it, it's a brand new concept that I've. Uh, sorry, the, the concept's probably not brand new, but the way I'm communicating it is new, Andy. And so, one thing we haven't mentioned is that um, that I am the guide in in something called the Culture Is Everything Club, and I've got a small group of people who are leaders who, and we come together once a month to to learn on a new leadership theme. Uh, and this month, the theme we're working on is creating stronger personal and professional connections with your teammates. It's a really important theme that we're working through and this empathy accountability continuum is part of that theme that we're discovering just this month of February 2021 and what I mean by that Andy is that when we've got teammates uh, and I used to live at the only at the empathy end of this continuum uh, and I was a people focused leader and let's say that I had a team member who was not being as effective as they possibly could could get stuff done they weren't being very accountable and six mondays in a row or maybe it was 16 mondays in a row i'd sit with them and and we explained very clearly what was expected and uh and well, at least it was clear to me uh and then we get to the end of the conversation and it would be something like do your best we'll meet again next monday and where are we going to get with that sort of approach well we're going to get the same body results as what, what we've, we've we've already got and so I actually needed someone to shine a light on the other half of this continuum. And that is what does accountability look like and how can I use the language and the skill and create the environment for people to step in to being more accountable in the work that they, they do. And so by understanding a, the full length of the empathy at one end to accountability at the other end it is, the, is the concept. And I'll give you an example of someone in my team that I'm working with right now, um, Andy, and that is that I've got a fellow called Mike and Mike leads ops for us, operations for us. And Mike has stepped up and taken on a, a greater accountability or greater responsibility for the data in our business. He is, uh, information is critical for all of us business owners. And Mike has stepped up. He's been doing some really important work. He's done um, advanced Excel courses, been using Power BI. He's really getting deep into the, into the data. And that project that he's working on is brand new for him. It's a new skill. And I'm, I'm at the empathy end of the, of the continuum when I'm working with him on that because it's new. I'm supporting him. I'm giving him feedback and I'm encouraging him to, to step into to more and more uh, of, of this skill. At the other end, Andy, is that we are coming off Christmas, uh, New Year, uh, Australia Day, public holiday, all sorts of um, downtime here in Australia, not to mention some, um, some circuit breaker, some short lockdowns that we're having because of the pandemic. And so Mike has got also some very firm uh, growth of cons consultation numbers or, or number of clients we need to service in, in our business as well. And he's done that before. He's got a team of people that he leads that are middle managers that have got teams that know how to deliver consultation to our clients. And therefore, the targets were set with Mike in um, uh, collaboratively with Mike and his team leaders. And I'm definitely at the accountability end of this, the continuum with, with that particular task because where are we up to? What are we doing? What happened in the last seven? What's happening in the next seven? And really strong on the accountability. But only when you understand the empathy accountability continuum can you choose the right moment to, to dive into the right type of communication, Andy. That's what I mean by that uh, continuum. Does that make some sense to you? It does and so is this is this in your book does it talk about the uh, it, it's not in the current version but give, but it's about to be andy that's uh, i'm working on the next version yeah i like this idea and you gotta you know pick your points along this path of where you need to sit based on probably you know who you're dealing with and their own you know personality and what uh, how they like to receive information what the context of the conversation may be so if you're talking yeah. about sales you know, potentially versus 
you know, marketing. I mean, there's a lot of different contexts um, and it's difficult. It's difficult for a leader to not be their normal self. It's probably difficult for you to go to the accountability side. It's difficult for me to go to the empathy side. So together we're the perfect person. Yeah. And Andy, I, th I think you, you've really honed in on this in a really powerful way. And and what we've been working through um, in the Culture is Everything Club about this empathy and accountability continuum is that the more you get to know someone both personally and professionally, uh, then the the easier it becomes to choose the right moment in time to be to, to, to lean towards accountability and towards empathy. And Andy, in, you um, know, recent turn of events in our business. And this is, I don't wish this upon anyone. And I wrote in Culture is Everything, in the Culture is Everything book, that hopefully not in your business or mine, but people do pass away at work. People do do die and hopefully it doesn't happen. And Andy, after 17 years, we, we tragically had someone who passed away in, in our business just a few weeks ago. Uh, and it was it was a really devastating situation. And, and that was a real challenge for all of us, both personally and professionally, but also as a leader, um, that this empathy accountability continuum is, is so important at that moment in time because there's, there's so much empathy required. But then when do we start moving towards the, the accountability side of things? And, and then all of a sudden we're moving, we're, we're sort of getting back on track a little bit and we're doing our best to, to remember and, and honour this person we've lost and moving towards the work. But then someone has a really crappy day where, they, where they're, re they're really missing their, their workmate and their friend. And so then it's a, it's a shift back to the empathy side of things before moving back toward the accountability. It's, it's a continuous uh I guess the more you know people, the, the way you can connect with them in, in a better way. So yeah, it's really powerful concept, Andy. Yeah, it's like uh, like little dials on this thing. I'm gonna draw an image of this sports over with. Um, sorry to hear about your teammate you lost. And um, we, we we because of the work we do, we haven't had it internally in any company I've ever run or owned. Um, but we we deal we deal with it from a coaching perspective a lot. So yeah. we get we get those same calls. Um, talk a little bit about you said curious, calm, and connected. Mm -hmm. So I want you to talk talk a little bit about to be a good leader in it that, that leads culture. What does the curious side of this look like to you? So, Andy, there's there's two parts of them. We've already we've already dived in part of it. And that is curious about people, the people in your team. There there is no question that we need to be curious and connected to our team. And we, we've spoken about that in in, in detail. But um, the the underpinning, con so a curious mindset with your team, but then uh, never forgetting the importance of of the scheduled forty plus weeks of the year, the one to one meeting with 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 your direct reports with your team members is the foundation of building a strong and connected uh, 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 relationship with each team member, and that's part of part of the system. But on the on the uh, industry and people, it's also about being connected to our customers and, and to the future of what's happening in the industry. It's a curious about learning outside of the industry to then apply back, back within. And I think it's, I'm, I'm from the healthcare industry. And if I'm not careful, I spend my entire time focused within, within health. And I think we need to be curious around what's happening in other areas. It's definitely about people. It's about our customers. It's about the world. It's if you, uh, in our business, we'd be, be, be more and more obsessed about customer service and customer experience. And I think we all need to be. Uh, and so everywhere we go, being interested in what are they doing, how they're doing, it's about the people side of things, but it's the systems behind the people side of things, which is which is a really important concept there, um, Andy. So curious about people and willing to say, hey, that's different. Tell me more about that, please. I'd love to know what you're doing over there. How did you so beautifully serve me here? It's about that curiosity, but it's also the willingness to engage in conversations and then listen with these two things really deeply is the, uh, is the, is the concept there, Andy. That makes total sense. And, and the, I don't know how many times we hear this. Uh, sometimes we'll get a, um, a company will call us and they'll say, hey, do you have somebody, can you give me somebody who has coached or run an organization that was in physical therapy? And we're like, you don't really want that. You want me to get you a manufacturing expert just because they're going to have a different point of view than the 18 people you got sitting around the table talking about the same shit you always talk about. So yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. interesting because people are going to get comfortable in their own learning in their own space. Um, I have a goal, a number of books to read every year. Mm -hmm. um, and of those 10% have to be something I don't want to read. Like yeah, something right. that I don't agree with. 
I don't like, I pick it up and I go, Ooh, I don't want to read that. That's horrible. Um, and I make myself 10% of my number has to be those type of reads just so I have a little bit of different perspective. I still have to always agree with it, but it does, uh, it does enhance your learning. Talk about calm and connected a, a bit for, you know, cause calm, calm kind of threw me off when you said that. Yeah, sure, sure. And I'll, I'll ask the I'll answer the calm and connected one in just a tick, but I just want to circle back to the to the industry related thing for just one second, and that is that in the early part of my career, um, learning from all sorts of places, including people like you, Andy, including Petra Coach and and, and Vern Harnish and the like, who who give stories and examples from all sorts of different uh, industries, is so powerful. And the, the newsletters and stories that we all get is so useful. I really encourage people to do that sort of stuff. But these days, um, we are all, if you're not careful, you're all in, we're all in so many groups, Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, LinkedIn posts that are all specifically industry related. And I'm, I'm in them. I'm, I'm in my um, groups of physical therapy, Facebook groups. And the conversation in there is probably useful for some people. And it's probably useful for some of the people who do uh, are new to growing a business. But it just reinforces the same problems over and over again. It reinforces the same, dare we say, the, the leadership lid that John Maxwell, you would, um, would, would communicate. It's the same concept. So be very, very, um, I don't, I'm not saying don't join industry groups, but be very, very careful of being contained by those industry groups is, is important. I think we've, we've covered that point, but I just want to, the, the prevalence of Facebook groups and the like really does surround us by that sort of stuff if we're not careful, Andy. Exactly. Mm. So oh, now let's talk about this. Exactly. Carmen Connector, should we go into that? Let's go. Okay. Uh, Andy, I here's what I didn't understand. Building the system, uh, the culture building system, yes, this is what you need to do. Moving forward to be a better leader, yes, let's learn how to lead other people. There's something that I don't think that any of us can do, and I certainly can't do, uh, do to lead other people if I can't do this thing first, and it's to lead myself. And if I can't lead myself and know myself on my very own empathy, accountability continuum, and when am I needing to be easier on myself and give myself a break because I've been I've had a tough time and um and like the the difficult situation of a, of a team member passing away is where I'm more towards the empathy empathy side of things. Or Tristan, you've got a weekly top three and you've got one of the top three done. You need to be more accountable and say no to more things uh, and, and you need to be uh, lead yourself in a more effective way. Or Tristan, you haven't exercised in the last two weeks. You've been sitting at your desk. You haven't stood up. There's, there's the fitness and the personal side of things as well. And so Andy, the calmness uh, is overseen by this concept of we can't lead others unless we can lead ourselves. And unless we can take the time to, to listen, understand our own empathy, accountability continuum, and or our own fears, our own concerns, our own, I don't know, leadership lead, if you will, if you want to use, use that language, then I don't think it's possible for us to reach the potential that we're potentially going to re um, reach. Leading ourselves first is a powerful, powerful concept and is the very first theme that we teach within the Culture is Everything Club because people come to me to learn how to build a strong and empowered team via the, the Culture is Everything system. They then progress to wanting to learn how to become a better leader themselves. And, and there's, a, there's a critical bit in the middle there. Let's learn to lead ourselves before we can learn to lead others. And that's where the calm part comes into it, Andy. That makes total sense and something that uh, also is a bit hypocritical if you're asking somebody else to do something you're not willing to do yourself or doing yourself yeah well there's that there's that Andy but I think it's I think the calmness and look I, I, whether this is an important part of my life at the moment and 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 that is that um I've been leading a team for a long period of time I've been leading is I'm not sure you tell me Andy you're, you're further down the road on this than I am but um, leading children and a family and, and being a parent is is um uh is uh, something relatively I've got four kids under 10 in in our house here and and um I can assure you being anything but calm doesn't really work very well uh with uh with kids and uh and I think there's a lot of a lot of parallels there what, what's your experience there Andy yeah I mean uh yeah, the, my girls are older, so you're exactly, mine are out of the house. So I guess I led them right to where they needed to be. Perfect. Talk, Perfect. About, uh, talk about connecting or connection, and then we want to move from there to the system, because I want to get to the system piece. That's what people automatically are going to go there. Like, just tell me what I have to go do. Not who I need to go be, just tell me what I have to go do, because they don't want to think about the first thing. So why you started here. So talk about connection. 
Yeah. So calm, curious, and connected are, are very, very inter interrelated. And that is that uh, I don't think you can connect with people in a meaningful, uh, meaningful way and have a team which are connected people with in a meaningful way if you aren't calm and take the time to connect with them and you aren't curious about getting to know that person in any useful way. And so connected in some ways, Andy, is the outcome of being a calm leader who takes time to connect and, and be curious with their team and with the people around them. Because uh, here in Australia, um, uh, uh, Andy, I've, I'm going to in, embellish or indulge in something just for, just for a moment. I mentioned the mighty Richmond Tigers uh, in AFL right at the very start. And the Mighty Richmond Tigers, who is my favorite team, I hope to be the, the physical therapist for, they uh, were and also ran for a very long time, Andy. Uh, they were the, the top eight teams in the AFL teams, um, AFL ladder at the end of the season get to play in the finals. And for year after year after year, the Tigers were number ninth uh, and we didn't make the finals. And, um, and but... Uh, in 2010, we got a new CEO. His name was Brendan Gale at the Richmond Tigers. Uh, we had a board who was supporting him and he set a 10-year goal. The 10-year goal was to be, to be able to uh, eliminate debt from the club, to have 100,000 paid up members and to have uh, had three premierships or three championships within the next 10 years. And people laughed him out of town. They laughed him out of town because there's no freaking way that the Tigers would do that. They, they're completely self-sabotaging. The coach loses a few games. They boot them out the door. Uh, it's, it's not going not gonna to work. And Andy, in 2020, Richmond won the championship. And that was the third time in four years that they won the, the premiership or the, or the championship here. And there's a whole lot of talk about the Richmond Tigers culture and connected is the word that it continues to be used to really de define them. They're, they're a group of misfits in many ways. They've got a star who's uh, attached to, to bikey gangs and, 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 um, and uh, on the edge of the law in, in many ways. They've got these uh, all sorts of different characters, but connected is the word that they use. And it's the fact that they're connecting, they're calm, they're curious, and they're sharing their challenges as individuals and humans, which allows them to be more connected and therefore to perform better on the field as well. And so that's sort of the, the foundation of, of where, the, where the word connected comes from, Andy. That's perfect, man. And I, and I see that with teams all the time, including my own, the more, the more connections. And it's been difficult this year, well, 2020 to 2021 year. Uh, to yes. keep, yeah, to keep those connections. It's turning into years, Andy. Yeah, and but it, you know, if you focus on it, you'll figure out a way to make it happen. We've, uh, you know, we work with teams all the time. So move us to mm. systems, um, which is, you know, the premise of the book is a lot around what you need to go do. Uh, we've had yep. conversations about who you need to become in order to be more successful, because if you just go do stuff, you may not make it anyway. Um, yep. but talk about the systems and, and where does it start and what, what might somebody go do first and second and third? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So the the culture is everything system, are the uh, it's a four part system that uh, that comes with a checklist inspired by the Rockefeller Habits checklist, uh, and and so it's the checklist of the things that we were using inside the Physio Co that helped us to build a strong team culture and grow significantly to be a, to be a great place to work. The four parts of the system, Andy, are firstly discover the core, uh, secondly document the future. Thirdly, execute relentlessly. And fourth, show more love. Now, we can work through each, each of those, but, but I just want to, people love to get some quick wins on this sort of stuff. And it's, it's really important that um, we understand that a culture system takes time to build and there's hard work in there. But if you want some quick wins, straight to the show more love section is, is the part that I would really recommend people because show more love is where we can quickly, hopefully, take a moment to slow down and realize that we have got to connect with our team members. We have to have a culture of catching people doing something right. We have to provide recognition. We, we have to make sure we realize that people have crap times at home. Sometimes um, People are having crappy times at home. And if we then automatically think that, that it's all about work and we give them a hard time at work, then all of a sudden we've got a, a team member who's having a, a shit of a time at home and then they come to work and their boss is giving them a hard time as well. That is a disaster waiting to happen, Andy. That's not someone that's going to be a, a high performer in your team. So show more love is the fourth part of the, sec, uh, of, the, of the system. I can share a couple of the points in there, but for quick wins, that's where the real action is, Andy. Yeah, one of the things that we do from a, as a coaching organization when we uh, kick off a new company, we usually work with the executive team first, is we give them what we call an appreciation bag. And this comes from 
Jack Daly, you know, Jack. So yeah, yeah, Jack yeah. Daly's money bag idea is just, all it is is appreciation. Thank you cards is all that's in there. Um, and then we teach them how to write a note of appreciation or a thank you note to another team member. And we have them practice it in the room. And that becomes part of the, the ritual of things that they need to do. That would fall into your show more love category. What else is in there? What else, what else, what else would be in here? Recognition, you said, et cetera. Yeah. So, so with the show more love section, um, Andy, what a few things about it is people are getting recognized if they if they add something to the culture they are getting recognized and it's a, it's a regular system maybe it's a reward and recognition program whatever it might be but but a regular recognition so firstly from teammates we need to make sure there's peer recognition but we can't ever forget and let's let's embrace the the theme of jack daly here um andy recognition from the ceo or from the business owner or from senior managers on a regular basis is really 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 important jack daly taught us about the idea of sending cards to people on their birthday on their anniversary when they're hitting goals personally and professionally and as i look around andy um on my desk here i can hold up some cards that here is a nine year um, anniversary card for someone who's been working at physio co for nine years and here is a three-year anniversary card for someone who's been working at the physio co for three years they are on my list to write on to, to write dear dan happy third tpc anniversary love your work and so grateful that we're, we're in the same team together keep it up tristan and that heads off in a little red envelope which is uh which is our company colors to, to people's team and and so regular recognition on the small things which to the CEO who's trying to balance the books and grow the business and they're so focused on, on growth of the business, sometimes we forget to connect with small moments with our team members. So um, personal recognition for CEOs is another one. Um, Andy, two more, I'll just quickly mention in the show more love section. One is having a budget for when bad stuff happens in people's lives. Uh, bad stuff does happen. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a, a member of our team whose family lost their pet dog who was 14 years old uh, and to to them it was it was a really sad and challenging week for them to to work through it and then now their backyard is very very empty and, and challenged and, and therefore and sorry it's a sad place for them to go as opposed to a happy place for them to go and so we understood this and, and we, we, we sent them they, they decided that they were going to plant some more plants in their backyard because they couldn't in the past because the dog used to dig them up, uh, and and so we we sent them some plants to uh, to plant in the in the backyard and just some some small uh, one listening, two responding, and three making sure you have got money available to do that sort of stuff is is another way. So that's that's another part, Andy. And the last thing, and this is learnt from Tony Shea of Zappos, who sadly passed away last year, but um, the annual culture book. And that is that we do all this work to build a great company, to build a strong culture. Do not ever forget to capture the memories of what happened in your, in your team in that particular year. Uh, Tony Shea calls it a, a culture book. It's effectively a yearbook is, um, is the way. And I'll, I'll hold up a, um, here's the ninth edition of the PhysioCo culture book from 2020. And guess what? There's Zoom squares on the front, Andy, uh, because we spent, uh, we spent the whole of 2020 uh, in, uh, on, on Zoom. But capture the memories is a really, really powerful and important part. And yes, you can have build a create a glossy book like that, or it can be much simpler, a short video um, or a message from the from the owners. It can be a, a group of photos. Do what you will, but capture the memories is another important part of the show my love section. I wrote that down because that's not something that we do a very good job or talk to people about. So I appreciate you sharing that with me for sure. And I'm assuming mm. that you put like teams of people or small groups of people or somebody's in charge of like who owns the the yearbook for you you have a, a team member that's their thing yeah look there is how the how the yearbook comes together is that every year um towards the end of the year i, I so i've got a regular rhythm of of email updates to our team andy i think that's really important that um that the ceos the owners do have a regular communication channel and in that in that email i put out a link to a, a little google survey and uh, and people fill out that survey and then i've got a uh, a team member actually after all these years my wife still owns the culture book uh, andy and so she she loves to collate and uh, and put it all together and she's sort of the the owner of the culture book and then we we've, we've got a designer who helps to to make it make it look as pretty as, pretty as we can yeah so the point being somebody owns it, uh, not not just you what are, uh, walk me through so we've got um the core discover your core yep uh, document the future and um Execute relentlessly. Execute, execute relentlessly. So where are we going next? And we've got about 15 minutes or so. So let's choose one of these and dig into it. 
Yeah, sure, sure. So look, Andy, I'll quickly give you an overview so people understand. And so Discover the Core is about a core purpose and a core values. Uh, we are, we've learned this from Jim Collins. Um, really important to know who we are and what's, what's deeply important to us is, is the Discover the Core part of the, the system. Um, on the on the same on the other side of the same coin is where the heck are we going uh, now that we understand who we are and what's important to us? And so, document the future is about vision. It's about being clear. The the BHAG or the North Star, and I like to call it a ten year obsession. I know I know that Jim Collins uses the term big, hairy, audacious goal, and he um, uh, I believe Andy, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but somewhere between a ten and thirty year timeline is um, is is what he. Um, put on the BHAG. Is that your understanding, Andy? Yeah, I like the 10 year to 30 year because you can't argue with me. Like I can say anything can happen in that time frame because it can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not as brave as you, Andy, and that is that um, I like to to hang around the 10 year um, timeline. And so I, I like to call it a 10 year obsession. What are we going to obsess over about creating over, over the next 10 years? And um, and quick quick story on the 10 year obsession is in our business at the PhysioCo, because we, we live this stuff. And so we had a 10 year obsession from 2009 to the end of 2018. And I can, I can tell you, we made some fantastic growth during that time, but it took us 11 and a half years to hit our 10 year obsession, uh, Andy. And, uh, and uh, it really doesn't matter as long as you, you make that growth. Yeah. And it, it, what, what it, was, it, just out of curiosity, what was, so I'm being a curious leader. What, what was the, the 10 year obsession that took 11 years? Yeah, so the 10-year obsession, and there's an interesting part of this too, Let's, uh, I'll, I'll explain this too. The 10-year obsession was to deliver 2 million unique and memorable consultations to our senior clients. So yeah. it, was about, it was about delivering consults. But here's where my growth and, and our growth as an organization has, has developed. And that is, we've got no idea of how effective those consultations were. Uh, and, and we might, we might have, it was about output. It wasn't necessarily about, uh, about achieving anything specific. Right. And so our next 10 year obsession, which is a similar number, it's, um, we, we've, it's a similar, number, it's 2.028 million, which, which is 2.028 million expanded out is 2028 so we are working towards the 2028 timeline of helping two point helping our clients set and smash 2.028 million goals they're so helping goals. us yeah they're their own goals their health goals so we yeah. we discover what's important to them and they might have a health goal that by april they want to be able to walk a certain distance or, or so they can go on a holiday or cruise or in their caravan or whatever they want to want to do and we will then help them to set and smash that that goal is that's the next 10-year obsession that's beautiful man yeah uh, so that's time we have left, um something that's near and dear to my heart is executing relentlessly and um there's, a, there's an old quote that says most great ideas die at the altar of execution or yes. execution um, is always worshiped because you know, we can come up with all this stuff, but unless somebody actually goes and gets it done, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. So yeah. from a system standpoint, talk about executing relentlessly and, and what in, in the, you know, the book and in your own experience keeps somebody on that path. Yeah, so, so um, I'll, I'll quickly talk about these, Andy. And so we, we talked about um, discover the core and document the future being the two sides of one coin. Um, what, who are we and where are we going? Well, then there's two sides of the next corner. That is execute relentlessly is the important part of making sure we get there. But at the so same time, we have to show more love to our people and connect uh, in an important way. Otherwise, people get sick of it pretty, pretty darn quickly uh, and it's got to be valuable. So execute relentlessly, Andy. The important part about this is we have to live our own system. And, the, and I'm talking about daily and regular rituals, the daily huddle, critical part of executing relentlessly to making sure that we're, we're connecting on it, on it. And daily huddles have to happen and they have to happen in a valuable way. This is the biggest challenge with daily huddles. People are like, oh, they're boring or they don't, they don't add any value. And so they have to be useful. They have to be energy. They have to be human to human, but they also have to help people do their jobs in, in, in a better way. So daily huddles are a critical part of execute relentlessly. Another part of it, um, Andy, is a robust recruiting process. We have to have execute relentlessly on finding the right people and then keeping them engaged in a, a robust re recruiting process. And there's nothing, there's no rocket science here. This is embedded or, or learnt from the important work of, of the smart family and um, top grading is the is the concept. And, and Andy, I, I, I understand that you, you definitely um, know this sort of stuff and teach this sort of stuff. But um, if I can summarize a robust recruiting process from my experience down to two critical parts, it is 
a multi-step process and a multi-person process. Uh, we definitely have to make sure that there's a multi-step person. When people apply, they go through multiple touch points to get to know the, the person, not just the person who might be very, very good at applying for jobs and very, very good at interviewing for jobs, but the person who actually is uh, understood and we can assess them as best as we possibly can. And multi-person, because if, I look for people that are just like me, Andy, um, if I'm not careful. And I think we all do uh, look for people that are just like ourselves if we're, not, if we're not careful. So therefore having multiple people who are assessing with a scorecard to make sure that they understand how does this person fit our core values? How does this person fit um, where we're headed? How are they going to contribute to our vision? And also their, their skill or competency is a scorecard for every interview. So Execute relentlessly is both internal about daily huddles, but it's also external about um, attracting the right people through a robust recruitment process. Uh, just a couple of parts of the execute let me, relentlessly. System. Let me feed back the, um, the robust recruitment process. So there's a scorecard mm -hmm. and that's a top rating methodology uh, term. Essentially it's, a, essentially it's a job description that is a lot more detailed. If you were gonna describe your perfect person to be in a relationship with, like you would have all the stuff on this page. Yeah. That's basically what you're doing for every role in a business. But once you have your scorecard, you should be able to read it and say, and get a, a, a visual of a person. And then you said uh, multi-layer and multi-person. Yep. So you, you've got, it's not just one and done. It's you're going to do this and you're going to do this and you're going to do this and you're going to do this. And you got to design what that is. And you're going to do it with this person and this person and this person and this person. Is that That's pretty it. accurate? Look, look, Andy, it is. And when you when you spell it out like that, for emerging businesses who are, are, are flat out just uh, just doing the doing, that sounds a really painful and and difficult thing to do compared to receiving applications, thinking that person sounds fine, having a quick interview, and then moving on to the next job on your list. I'll just re reaffirm the importance of you do that approach of quickly receive applications, interview, and they'll be fine and move on. Then you're stuck with the problems of the wrong people that, that don't, uh, and that takes a hell of a lot more time than investing an extra few hours in deciding if this is the right person or not uh, to, to get the job done. So that, that's the, the critical point that I want to really be clear there, Andy. And if you're hiring, if you're hiring for a frontline, um, you know, frontline type of an individual doing a job, you might have two or three layers with one or two people. If you're hiring for a mid-level manager, supervisor, C-level position, you might have 10 layers and seven people. So the, the complexity of the role, and you can think about it as pay grade, um, should dictate what is the process. But you know, making sure that it is multi-layer, not just one and done, and making sure it has multiple people so you got different sets of eyes. I wrote an article a bunch of years ago and I entitled it The Toilet Seat. And my comment was simply, um, we're going to share a toilet seat. Like you're going to be we're working in my office. We're going to share a toilet seat and we're going to share it for a long time. I'm going to get to know you before I put you on my toilet seat. Yeah. So that was, yeah. uh, you know, that was I sometimes we'll just say that to people. Because, yeah, you know, it makes total sense. We do need to get to know that these people aren't too crazy. Andy, I, I love that. I think that's that's really, really powerful. And, and I think that just a, a quick thought that um, I know we're getting short of time, but a quick thought that I've made mistakes on over the years and that is that as you hire more experienced people and more capable people yes you do need to interview them in more more detail and more depth and take more time but the wrong people who are applying for those jobs will think the interview process is not worthwhile and they're beyond or above the uh the interview process and that's a that's a big filter in the first place and if someone is ready and willing to to do the first interview, then catch up for a cup of coffee and then go for a walking meeting and then do, do and then spend some time with your team members and they love it and they're engaged and they can't get enough of it. Now that's a great sign that, you, that you're on the right track. Uh, if someone's like, can we just do another interview or do you need to speak to my referees? Uh, that's a real sign that you may not have the right person uh, in, in the pipeline just there. Yeah, and you can build filters. Uh, one of the things that we do internally is we have an application process that's online, very simple. You fill this little simple thing out, but we want you to shoot a video of yourself answering a couple of questions for us and submit the video. So it's just an extra hurdle. If somebody cannot do that or they don't do that, they're probably out anyway. Because we're, you know, we use technology a ton. We need people to be able to do that. And we want to see how you come across on video. A lot of our work today is on video. It makes total yep. sense. 
but you can just build these hurdles multi-layer doesn't necessarily have to mean two hours in a room with somebody. It could just be a seven minute phone call as one of the layers. Yeah. Entirely. Entirely. It's um and and when you check so but a seven minute phone call, Andy, there's so much to be to be found out. Does does someone turn up on time? What do they do they not turn up on time? Do they take six of the seven minutes talking about themselves without asking any questions? There's there's so much to be considered from um from, from that sort of uh that step in the in the system. Yeah, not difficult. Well, listen, um, any last words? Uh, Culture is everything is the book. Uh, we've got the podcast. Make sure you're connecting on the podcast, gang. Um, any kind of last words to leaders that are on this, like around culture? Like if you get to, if you, if you had one last parting thought, what would it be? Yeah. The last parting thought is, is this, this importance of the fact that culture is such a powerful and important concept in business and it takes time. So I, I would encourage people not to rush it, but I encourage people to have just a one percenter or, or a five minute task they're doing every single day to connect with another person, to understand a bit more about the culture system and to, to chip away at it execute relentlessly if you will andy on on the importance of building a culture system because it will pay off more than nearly anything else that i know of in business uh so don't rush it but chip away and i've got my planner in front of me and i, I suspect you've got your version somewhere there andy and that is that um that have something related to culture on your top three list of priorities each and every day is something i'd really love to share awesome man well listen great to see you um, glad you're doing so well. Thanks for getting up so early to be here today. Uh, Tristan White, one of my longtime friends, we've known each other. One of the things that we do here, we support an organization called Tiny Superheroes, and they have these little cool superhero capes. You yeah. see this is like a little cape. So um, there's an EO member in St. Louis, and her organization makes these capes and packages them up, and they send them out to little kids that are dealing with um, some disease or you know some kind of something that's going on that's making them not feel great. Um, to yep. turn them into a superhero for a day. So we're going to donate some capes to the kids in your name. Um, awesome. we'll keep that organization um, delivering these things and delivering happiness. So great to see you, my friend. You can rest you guys. Take care of yourselves. If we can do anything for you, let us know. There'll be a recap in your inbox within 24 hours with all the information. Thanks, Tristan. All right. Thanks, Andy.